Hello, this is Tracy Schroyer, and I wanted to bring you another video in this series on my uh, breast cancer journey and what I've experienced. And I'm trying to play catch up a little bit. I wasn't doing videos as things were happening. So I'm almost to the end of the uh, backtracking and getting those uh, caught up. And in this uh, uh, video, I wanted to talk more specifically on uh, the last video I talked about preparation for surgery and some of the different things that I put in my hospital bag, some of the things I had um, when I got home and that kind of thing. Just to add to that also, um, prior to going into surgery, I did change some furniture around within the main room um, that I knew I would be in um, when I came home from surgery and didn't end up liking the setup that I had. So ended up, um, thankfully, my husband, a friend of his came, a friend of ours really came up and uh, a friend of mine had come from out of state and were able to help us to rearrange a couple things. So I um, thought that I would be able, so it basically had to do, I had a recliner. We actually have, my husband has a recliner and we have a double recliner, um, which I wanted for, the, you know, one of the, where both of the dogs to jump up on and be able to lay next to me without wanting to try to get on me. Um, so we have that, his recliner and the double recliner in this room I'm in now. And then we also had a couch, um, that it was really a um, just a long kind of narrow couch and I thought that would be comfortable for me um, but when I got home I realized that there wouldn't be enough room on either side so to use um, the pillow I had shown before and here it is I have it next to me uh, this pillow to fit on a side um, and then other pillows to prop up my arm um, from my lymph node side um, there wasn't like any room other than laying there. So when I got to the point where I could lay down, I wanted to make sure that I had more than enough room. And we do have a bigger, comfier couch. And let me turn this and show it to you there. It's a big, huge, uh, it's not a chase lounge, but it's kind of like, I can't remember what it's called, a cuddler, cuddler or lounger on the end of it. Um, the big comfy couch so I can put um, pillows on either side of me and be able to lay. Um, comfortably on. So thankfully, um, my husband, his friend, and my friend were able to uh, move some things around. So they brought that that red couch out and put the other smaller one out in our other room. So I'm so thankful that they were here and they were able to, able to do that. Something I didn't, I guess, didn't come to mind um, about needing all that room for all the pillows um, to be around me. So uh, what I want to talk about today is going into surgery and um, just what happened, um, the outcome of surgery, and then maybe the, like the first couple days after, and maybe the first really week or two after, um, and how that was being home. So I went in, my surgery was on February 13th of this year, 2020, and um, I went in pretty early in the morning and the night before it started to snow here in Ohio. So we were a little bit worried about um, being able to get there in time. Um, the hospital is about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes away from where we live. Um, so we left extra early. So we sat in the car in the parking lot for a while um, when we got to the hospital that morning and um, went in and I had my bag with me that I had shown on the other video with all my stuff ready and went to check in and there was a ton of people there um, that had already checked in. I was surprised how many uh, surgeries they had um, and various different kinds of surgeries. Um, and so uh, checked in and what they did was they gave us a key to a locker um, at the hospital we were at and we were able to put my stuff in it um, my husband's stuff, my mom was there too, you know, her coat or whatever. Um, and there was a big, pretty big waiting area and they had a really nice cafeteria downstairs. And um, so we put stuff in there and then my husband was able to hold on to the key. And then from there, we had to wait just not even five minutes really. And they took me back um, to do the prep. And what they basically said is they would take me back uh, to start doing the prep. And then they would call my husband back and my mom um, to come back uh, a little bit after that when we were ready or when I was all ready. So I went back into the room. And to be honest, it reminded me so much of House. If you think of, if you've ever seen House, um, the show, and the rooms where they like quarantine people and the you know the sliding glass doors that's what those kind of prep rooms were so i went in there 
And I was very thankful because the nurse that was helping me um, to do some of that initial prep and get going was also one of the nurses that did part of my pre-admission testing. And she said that is rare. Um, she's the only one that does work on the, both of those areas. Um, but it was nice and kind of comforting to see somebody um, that I had met before. And so she had started by um, like taking my blood pressure and doing just some basic things. Um, had me get changed into um, the hospital gown, put the socks on, um, and I ended up, had to put my clothes into a bag. Um, hold on just a moment. Okay. Big dog. Running around, scruffling. So, um, got in the back, got my hospital gown and everything on and, um, all the fun stuff. Um, had to take a pregnancy test to confirm that before going in. Um, so everything was all ready. And from there, they called my mom and my husband back. And two other people that were going to be there um, for the day of my surgery is a, a coworker of mine and actually two coworkers of mine. Uh, one's my boss. Um, so they actually came and worked from the hospital uh, the day of my surgery, which was so nice and comforting. And it comforted me too from the perspective of. Um, my husband not just having my mom there, but having um, a couple friends um, and people from work that he knew really well. So they came and they were able to work. Um, the one thing the hospital did do is they wrote down the names, just the first names of everybody that was there and who was family. Um, so when the doctor came out to talk, um, to tell them to give an update, they would only pull back uh, my husband and my mom um, since they were the family. Um, so if there was anything that my husband and my mom wanted to relate to, um, you know, my coworkers, they were able to do that outside of that. Um, but they were the only ones in that meeting. So my mom and my husband came back and sat in that little, like I mentioned, the quarantine little room, um, waiting for me to be taken back. And so we were there and the first person to come in, um, they, they were doing all kinds of stuff. They got an IV ready in my arm. Uh, the first person to come in was the uh, plastic surgeon. And so he came in, he asked my mom and my husband to step out. He closed the curtain, um, pulled down my uh, gown and uh, wanted to uh, draw on me. And so he took, you know, a clean marker or whatever from the wall. And um, he had done a, it was kind of interesting. Let me put this down a little bit. So he had taken the marker and made a, a um, a line underneath each of my breasts and he had also done I think it was like right in here um, to know where the center was and then he might have done some other uh, and then he's and he went over here and he put his initials he's like I said what's that and he said I have to initial I was like oh you're signing your artwork in advance <laughs> so I will tell you I had and I've had a very good sense of humor throughout this because that has helped me to get through a lot of things. I know it's hard for other people. Um, and he's one that I, I found that I can you know, throw a little joke or two at. So he was laughing. He's like, in a way, yeah. Um, so he said one thing is that it helps the staff when you go back for surgery. They know that he's talked to you and kind of prepped with you and everything. So he did that. He was, um, you know, he said he would see me back um, in the surgery room. I never saw him in the surgery room because I was out by then. But um, so he left, my mom and my husband came back in and then um, it was probably within 10 minutes or so. And like I said, there was snow and everything. So it was hard for them to get in. Um, but my breast surgeon came in and um, she came in and she, you know, did the same thing. And she ended up marking, um, her mark was really interesting because, let me put this down. So here's my breast. She ended up just on one side. I think she, she might have done the other side. Maybe I was out of it or something. Um, but she did more of kind of the line and went around the nipple and the line over to kind of know where she was going to cut to go into. And then she did like her signature on the other side as well. Um, she also uh, at the time, so for those of you who may not have watched some of the other videos yet, um, I was doing a, I was doing a double mastectomy with reconstruction with tissue expanders. Um, the other thing that she, the breast surgeon had done is gotten, um, there was somebody else there and I want to say they were nuclear or something. I can't remember the, the name of the person, the nurse. Um, but the breast surgeon got the 
um, needle ready and she ended up, it was almost near, um, I would say near my nipple, um, but she put the needle in, um, she might have numbed it a little bit, I don't remember. And I wasn't even out of it at this point. I just don't remember very well if it hurt. I think it hurt just a little bit. Um, and put, it was like a radioactive something in it. And basically what it is, is they have to do that a little bit before surgery. And I don't know how, maybe it takes a half an hour or something like that. Um, so that it basically lights up or colors, I think it colors um, the nodes and kind of shows them how far things are reaching and that kind of thing. Once she gets in there, she can kind of see um, so that's why they had to do that. Um, I have heard just from some of the groups I've been part of that people have gone and had to do that. I, I thought I've heard people say they've done that like the day before. So I don't know how long it lasts in there um, or have to go to another area and get it done. Um, but she had done that in the prep for the surgery. Um, so she had said she would see me in there and um, she left. And it was uh, funny because a, a couple of people were congregating kind of out in the hallway. I was kind of like, oh, there's a party waiting for me to go back. And um, <coughs> excuse me. So then um, they took my hair uh, and they put, I kind of put it up like this. And they put one of those um, hairnet or not the hairnet, like the hospital thing um, over my head so that they could take me back and uh, said, you know, goodbye to my mom and gave my husband a kiss and said, you know, I'll see you, you know, probably in recovery. And what they had said is that when I came out and I was in recovery, there would be two people that could come back. So prior to surgery, um, they had said that I could have two people in there at any time leading up to when I you know, got ready to get taken back. And those could be, you know, my coworkers if they had come back or, you know, my mom and my husband or whoever it was, they could change places. They did say that when I got out of surgery and went to recovery, that it would have to be the same two people. This is probably a protocol different for any hospital or different, any different location that you go to. Um, so I had said, you know, it definitely it would be my mom and my husband that could be in the recovery. So they said, um, uh, you know, okay. And so they ended up taking me back and I, so here's what I remember up until the time that I really passed out from all the um, anesthesia is um, they started to wheel me back and I don't really know what I was thinking at that point, but we got to a certain spot. We went through doors and it got really, really cold. And I know that's usually a lot for, you know, the surgery and the cleanliness and all that kind of stuff. Um, got really, really cold and they took me into the operating room and the nurses and everybody was getting ready. They had stuff written on a whiteboard. I made sure my name was on there. My birthday was on there. Like made sure this is me, this is what you're doing. And, and uh, they were preparing things for the surgery. And there was two, there was actually three nurses helping to prepare me. And the one thing that I really remember is I had thyroid surgery done uh, 2013 and had part of my thyroid removed. They tested it for cancer. I had a lot of cysts on it. There was no cancer, so they left the other half in. But when I went in for that, I remember sitting outside the operating room, laying outside the operating room, and they injected whatever they needed to inject into my IV um, to put me out. I don't remember ever being moved over to the operating table. Like it was pretty darn quick. Like once they gave it to me within a minute or two, it felt like. Um, so don't remember even barely entering the operating room. In this occasion, what happened was they wheeled me into the operating room. It's bright, it's freezing, you know, everybody's getting ready for everything. They had me do most of the lifting to get myself onto the operating table from the gurney. I did that, which I just thought was so weird because you see the big old light wasn't on, but you know, to do the, the surgery and everything, everybody getting ready. And I just thought, what in the heck? This is just weird compared to my prior experience and my really only other surgery. So get over into the bed. I'm laying there. My arms are both end up laying out onto different things like hooked into the bed. And um, this side is my lymph node uh, or the, where the breast cancer is, is in this side. So this is where they would be taking the lymph nodes from. And that was closest to like the lighting and everything like that. So I'm laying there and even prior and you know, the prep, they put these big things on your legs, um, you know, underneath your knee up until your ankle. 
and every once in a while they start to pump and it's so to, I believe it's to help prevent blood clots from happening and things like that. So they keep those on during surgery. So those are on, they're hooking them up and everything. You know, I'm laying there with my arms out. Um, they hadn't put anything into my IV at that point. Um, I'm laying back and they were talking about the blood pressure cuff, um, that they have to put the blood pressure cuff on. So the lady starts out and she puts it trying to think of where she put it. She went to put it on this arm, but my IV was right in here. And so she was like, I can't put it there because of the IV. So then she goes to put it on this arm. And I looked up at her and I said, you can't put it on that arm because that's where they're taking the lymph nodes out of. So from now on, from what I know, from what the nurses and doctors have told me, since I have had lymph nodes out here, I cannot have blood pressure taken from here, not blood draws, not anything like that that's going to tighten or squeeze my arm because it could um, cause uh, more swelling and lymphedema. So the, that's off limits for now on. Even prior to surgery, I mean, they needed to get in there for surgery, so she couldn't put it there. So she went to put it down on one of my legs, and she was going to put it underneath one of the, um, the things, you know, preventing the blood clots, and a nurse had said that was that was fine. So then my breast surgeon walks in and she has her hair thing on. I, I recognize her just more because of her glasses from seeing her um, prior to surgery. And she said, you can put that on her left arm. And I, I was so glad I was still awake. I mean, they would have figured this out anyway, but she takes it off of my leg and she comes up to this arm. And I look up at her and I said, that's not my left arm. And then she goes, oh, and she goes to put it on my left arm. She's like, I can't put it on there because you're IV. And then she said, no wonder I put it on your leg. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. And I talked to somebody later and they're like, well, that, if that was the indication, you know, going into your surgery. And I said, I knew everything was going to be okay. You know, I felt fine. And, um, but it was just a little bit comical. And I'm like, well, thank, thankfully I was awake to help tell them, you know, what to do. And uh, so from there, they got that straightened out. And the next thing I know, they take the big thing to go put it over, you know, like your nose and your mouth, um, or was that the oxygen or whatever. Um, and she injected things into my IV and I could start to feel it. And I, it was with, it felt like a matter of a minute, if, if even that, um, that I was really out. And the next thing I know, I was uh, waking up in that. I don't think it was the same room, but it was another one of those house like quarantine rooms. Um, and a nurse was sitting outside kind of monitoring stuff and they were waiting for me to wake up. And um, I woke up and I had two big ice things laying on my chest. Um, I wasn't really, the thing that hurt me the most when I woke up was my back. And it was really my lower back. And I told the nurse when she came in, she realized I was awake. And I, she said, how are you feeling? And I said, my back, my lower back is killing me. And so she tried to like adjust the bed and help me kind of adjust. So it could have been like from laying there, how they had me propped up or some, I don't know what it was, but my lower back just like really, really killed me uh, from sitting there. And um, within, I, it really, I don't know how long it actually was, but it was probably within 10 minutes, I think, of, it felt like me waking up. Um, they were getting me ready to take me up to my room in the hospital. So I was staying one night, uh, overnight in the hospital. And I was kind of confused because I thought that they had said beforehand about like my mom and my husband were going to be in the recovery room. And I don't know, I even tried to find out later, like, how long was I in the recovery room? How long had I been in there after surgery? I'm not clear on that. Um, and maybe it was just, they wait until you wake up. I don't know what it was. So they had never been, you know, they didn't come to the recovery room. So they had told, the nurse had told me, um, the, the people with you are up in your room. They're waiting for you. And I said, okay. Um, so they, you know, wheeled me up and um, it was, I think it was, a, it was a really young guy that had went, gone to wheel me up. And then one of the, like the nurse's aides, um, I can't remember what they're called, PSA maybe, um, going to transfer me over to my bed from the gurney that he had wheeled me up on. And he 
had looked at me and I don't know, I'm guessing he had no clear understanding of either what surgery I had or how it impacts people because he went to um, pull up the bed or the gurney next to the hospital bed and he said, okay, he said, I'm going to need you. Or he said, could you, can you get into the bed by yourself? And I looked at him, I was like, no, I just, with my arms, I just couldn't really hardly do anything, especially with my right, my right arm as far as lifting. And he said, okay, he said, let me get the, you know, you got the nurse and they put something underneath to help slide me over. But he said, okay, what I want you to do is take your arms and cross them over your chest so we can move you. And I looked at him and I said, I can't even do that. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, eventually got slid over there, got situated. They actually put a knee, um, a pillow under my knees to help kind of prop my legs up. I still had those um, things to prevent the blood clots and they plugged those in. Um, they plugged me into an IV, put antibiotics um, in there. And they also had fluids. Um, what else? They had, I had um, in my nose, the oxygen. And I feel like there was one other thing. Um, so my IV was hooked up, my oxygen, the legs. Um, so they came in, they were getting me uh, different pain meds. Um, I think one thing that was very beneficial to me, and I had heard from a friend who had used the same plastic surgeon um, for her surgery is a PEX block, P-E-C-S block. And she said that was a lifesaver for the first, I think it was 48 hours after surgery, as far as pain goes, controlling the pain. So I had ended up, found out about that and called my plastic surgeon. It was a, I think it was the Monday, you know, the surgery was a Thursday. I called him on a Monday and I said, I want to make sure I get this. And uh, the nurse called back and said that's standard practice and what they do. I don't know. And I can't guarantee that it's standard practice for all um, surgery. So I would definitely uh, consult with your plastic surgeon um, to find out uh, if that's the case. Um, but I know it was significant enough, whatever it does, uh, to control that pain for me and to help me in those first 48 hours. Um, so I was in the room. I saw my mom and my husband. They were surprised how well I was doing, how awake I was. I wasn't really groggy or anything. And I can tell you, I was really, really surprised as well because when I had my surgery for my thyroid that I mentioned, that was in 2013, when I came out of the anesthesia, um, I was a hot mess. I was, um, my throat hurt really bad from the tube that they had. Um, I just, I felt like shit. <laughs> Um, so it was really hard when I went and so I was expecting that uh, when I was coming out of this and so I was very very shocked and relieved that that wasn't the case I didn't need to use the cough drops that um, some people have needed and I had in my bag just in case um, or do the ice chips or anything like that they did have me on a liquid uh, liquid diet when I came back to my room um, so it was I think my surgery was supposed to be about four and a half hours I'm not sure when I even came back to my room, it was like mid afternoon or something like that. Um, so I'm not sure if the surgery went a little bit longer or about, about that. I'm not clear on that. Um, so I didn't want anything at first. And then I think I got like, a a little like icy gelato or whatever it's, I can't remember what it's called, like a, an icy kind of thing. Um, and then drank a lot of water and with the fluids and everything, um, I ended up having to go to the bathroom within a couple hours. Um, and so the nurse helped me up. I was connected to everything. So she had to kind of unhook and uh, wheel the IV into the bathroom and help me. And my legs were really, really wobbly and getting up and moving. Um, but that was that first time. The other times, like I had to get up later and go to the bathroom and um, wasn't so wobbly. Um, so that went away pretty quickly for me, thankfully. Um, I did ask, so one of the things that I had put in my hospital bag, and I mentioned that in my prior video was underwear. <laughs> and I asked for that pretty quickly. So it was probably the second time I got up to go to the bathroom and the nurse got that and I was able to put those on. I learned how to pretty quickly do things one-handed. Um, so I would start to put on with my left hand and then 
use what strength I had in my right hand to kind of pull it up. Um, I was surprised at how much movement I had in my right arm um, that I could even like, not all the way, but kind of lift it even like, I'll show like lift it like this. Um, I was able to do that. Um, I continued to ice my chest because um, that felt really good. I tried not to do as many pain meds. Um, so I think I did two or three the whole time I was in the hospital. And so I had my surgery bright and early in the morning on a Thursday. I went home, I want to say it was four, by four o'clock the next day. We were waiting, my plastic surgeon got there bright and early Friday morning and um, was very, very uh, excited that I was doing really well. Things looked good. He took a look and everything and was healing nicely. He did not want me to ice nonstop. So he said um, he tries not to do that because um, to let things start to heal. And he recommended if I did feel like I needed to ice to only do it uh, maybe 10 to 15 minutes every hour. Um, so I did, you know, take, take those off and not do that as much. And um, trying to think of what else. I felt well enough within probably an hour of being, not even an hour of being in my hospital room that um, I asked my mom if she could let my coworkers know to, that they were uh, 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 able to stop up and see me. And I think they were a little surprised at how well I was doing too. Um, I did not sleep well at all. I barely, I might have had a few hours, two or three hours of sleep in the hospital and it would have been early in the morning, like four to seven or something like that. Um, they come in and check on you and um, want to take your temperature and, you know, all that kind of crap and um, just it, uncomfortable too. My back still really hurt from having to be, you know, propped up and almost sitting up uh, in the bed. Um, they don't want you, it, it hurts too much to lay too flat. Um, and they don't want you to do that and you can't be on your side. You can't, you know, none of that. So that was really uncomfortable. Uh, my mom did stay in the hospital overnight with me. And um, so she was able to do that. I'm trying to think of anything more. Uh, so Friday morning, my plastic surgeon came in. He said, you know, he checked everything out. Everything looked very good. Um, he was going to talk to his nurse and get me on the calendar for the following Friday to come in and see him and see how things were doing. So he was um, pleased with how everything had gone. Um, and he didn't really have any issues with placing the expanders once the breast surgeon was done with her part of it. and. Um, I think that was it for him. Uh, we were waiting on the breast surgeon to come in uh, to see me and she would have been the one to you know, finally release me. And we were waiting and waiting. And so finally the nurse called, I think it was around noon, it was between noon and one, called her office to find out what was going on and let her know how well I was doing. And based on all of that information um, and the stats and everything, she ended up uh, releasing me. So we went home, I think it was three or four o'clock. Um, so came home and uh, that first night, so came home and the dogs were so excited, but it was really, really hard. I had the drains in, um, I was worn out. It was hard to walk, you know, too far or anything, um, hard to move my arms, that kind of thing. I had a lot of pain on my left side, even though the right side was the lymph nodes. It felt like I had a ton of pain on my side itself on the left side and that was up until the point I even had my drains out so for the first two weeks I had a lot of pain over here and then it felt like it almost shifted and then I started to feel the lymph node pain and everything um, probably within one week or two weeks um, I felt a lot more pain on this side as well and being able to lift my arm um, so for the longest time I wasn't able to even lift it this high um, now I can lift it this high. Uh, when I go to do a stretch, I can actually, it starts to hurt right in here, like when I get up a little bit further. Uh, when I go to put on shirts or anything like that, if I'm wearing a shirt like this that doesn't have a zipper, I have to scrunch my arm and kind of put this one on first and then put this one on because I have more function, you know, flexibility in this arm uh, to do that. So, but it's getting a lot better. And I talked to some people about different exercises. I know some people go to physical therapy to work through a lot of that. 
um, I was able to look through some things and start to do stretching. And even when I got to the point where I could walk in the grocery store for a little bit, not for very long, but go and just grab a couple of things, I would not push the cart. That was a little bit too much on my chest to, to be pushing it. But I would be like kind of stretching my arm, you know, little by little and doing some exercises as I'm walking down the aisle. So I didn't care how funny it looked to other people. Um, so that was the big thing for me for the surgery and then afterwards. And I did have to wait, I want to say my surgery was Thursday. It was the following Wednesday that I got a phone call from my breast surgeon. And so my mom had told me, my mom and my husband told me that the breast surgeon came out after her portion of the surgery to get the breast tissue, to get the mass, all of that kind of stuff. And then she basically turns it over to the plastic surgeon to start his piece and then to, you know, stitch me up and everything. So she came out after her portion was done, talked to my mom and my husband and said that um, when they go into the sentinel node, which is the first lymph nodes that they hit, which if it was going to um, spread, that would be the first place to go. She had pulled two sentinel nodes and tested those, did the biopsy to figure out if they were cancer or not. She found cancer in one of them. Uh, I guess it was a, it was a little over a certain amount. I can't remember like how many millimeter or whatever, how they, they um, categorized that. It was a little over kind of the basic for something when we talked later on to one of the specialists, um, but it was still pretty small. It wasn't in the second lymph node they took from that initial spot. So what she had done because of that showing some spread, she goes to the, they're called axillary nodes, which are like the next set of nodes that they would go to. And so since it was in part of one, it could have started to spread into the others, even though it wasn't in all of the sentinel nodes that she pulled. She ended up pulling 18 sentinel lymph nodes um, and checking those. And thankfully, none of those were cancerous. So it was basically just starting its journey um, to spread uh, when we caught it in the surgery and everything. So I was very, very thankful uh, for that. But I, I believe the breast surgeon was really, really surprised. She was not expecting to find it at all there in the nodes. Um, so I knew from my mom and my husband telling me that, that there was something, you know, related to that. So I had gotten the phone call from my breast surgeon the Wednesday after, um, to see how I was doing. And then also to kind of tell me about pathology and what it showed. So what she ended up telling me is that, um, the pathology, as I mentioned about the lymph nodes, how many she took and the reasons why she took. Um, she also told me that in my right breast where they had seen through the mammogram, the ultrasound and the biopsy, the mass, the initial mass. There was also another tumor or mass um, right around it. I think it was right behind it. That was much, much smaller, um, but it was cancerous as well. Uh, and they got clear margins and taking out all of that, which I guess I would guess that would happen if they're taking, you know, all of the breast tissue, but it also will depend on how deep it is. Um, as I mentioned a long time ago in one of the videos, um, my mass was closest to my skin. So even after the mammogram and the ultrasound and the biopsy, um, I had gotten questions of, did I find this or did the, ma the mammogram? Um, and my response was the mammogram found it, but I can feel it now. I could feel, oh, it was, it's eerie to think about that, that I could feel it then. Um, so got that. Um, but she also, they did pathology on the left breast also when they took all of that breast tissue. And she told me there was what they call hyperplasia, atypia uh, cells. And basically it's abnormal cells that could or could not become cancer eventually. When she told me that, I said to her, I remember saying this out loud, I said, that validates my decision 100% for doing the double mastectomy. The fact that, you know, I even thought, what if something was to come up or, you know, maybe it would never become cancer, but it was that comfort to me to, to feel validated in making the decision um, to do the double mastectomy. Um, so then I had a follow-up with her. Um, I think it was the, it was probably a week and a half after for her to check everything and look at everything. Um, she was, my breast surgeon was actually the one that ended up pulling all four of my drains. So I had shown when I talked about 
uh, surgery prep and things that you would use um, like post-surgery when you get home. I said about recording the drains and how much is coming out of those. Um, so she was fine with the low number. Um, and I actually gone to her probably four or five days after my plastic surgeon. They were low when I went to him, but he wanted to wait um, a few more days. And I was going to see him like a week later or seven days later. I can't remember what it was. Well, when she had seen me, she saw how low the numbers were. He had already told me if she feels like they're low enough, she could pull them. Otherwise, I would be seeing him. Like I saw her on a Friday. I would be seeing him on a Monday. He would pull him on Monday, most likely. Um, so thankfully, she was like, I'm not going to make you go through all weekend with this. She knew, you know, people that it's painful. Um, so she ended up pulling all of those. It did not hurt necessarily for me to have them pulled. The thing that hurt more than getting them pulled was uh, when they took the stitch out. Oh man, I just kind of like, you know, tensed up a little bit when they took the stitch out. So there was two on one side and two on the other side. Um, so that I would say would probably be the most painful part for me. Um, what I had noticed in the week, in the couple weeks after, it was more of the starting the week after, I had, um, it was some swelling like right here. And I described it as um, within my sports bra band, I had a little bit of swelling here. And I thought for sure it was probably from the drains being taken out. And even though they were really low, um, there might have been some fluid that built up. And I remember reading in some of my groups, people have had that happen. Thankfully, mine was not, you know, a significant amount. Um, but I did even just last week when I got to see my plastic surgeon, I told him it was still, you know, uncomfortable. And so he felt it. He goes, there might be some. He's like, we'll try to, they call it aspirate. Um, so he'd take a needle and he put it into my side and man, <laughs> it hurt. Um, so I think he put a little numbing stuff on there, but he put it in and then he had to kind of move it around and that hurt even more. He could not find where there was fluid to aspirate it and take it out. So, um, I just told him, stop, don't worry about it. Like I'll deal with it, you know, whatever, and keep putting ice. Um, so I do ice. Um, I haven't done it in the last couple of days or so. It's not as, somehow it feels better after I saw him, even though he wasn't able to take fluid out. So I don't know what, what that was all about. Maybe it was a mind thing. Um, so it is still a little bit swollen. I can tell that and looking at it and my arm, even right from here all the way down to like here, um, in my armpit and everything is very, very numb. Um, so it's the weirdest thing putting deodorant on um, and not being able to really feel that. And even like when I've gone to shave uh, my armpits, it's it's a weird feeling. It's not like you can't really feel it, but it's so numb and, and weird to the touch uh, of doing that. So, uh, so that is information on my surgery experience. And then really the update uh, with the breast surgeon. And then I will share in another video my update with my plastic surgeon uh, from there to kind of bring everything up to date um, and then share with you as I go through this journey and uh, the experience that I have. So thank you for listening and have a great day.